Hey folks, we have something a bit different for you today. We're doing a feed exchange with another podcast we think you'll enjoy called History's Trainwrecks, which explores some of the not-so-greats of history and how they fell short of glory and the self-destructive tendencies that come with great power and responsibility. Hello, and welcome to History's Trainwrecks. Episode 4, Stubborn Nags of Ancient Rome, Part 1. Sometimes a republic on its way to becoming an empire could really use an intractable stick in the mud to run things and hold up an annoying example for everyone else to be resentful of. Ancient Rome was blessed with two, Cato the Elder and his great-grandson, Cato the Younger. The Catos Cato the Elder, born in 234 BCE, was a simple fellow of simple tastes. He inherited a small patch of land when he was young, and spent his youth learning how to run a farm. One of his neighbors was Manius Curius Denatatus, a man known for his military feats and rigid, simple character. The young and impressionable Cato had found himself a role model. His chance at military service came with the second of Rome's famous wars against Carthage, the Second Punic War, in 218 BCE. Cato's service in the legions contributed to a decisive victory at the Battle of the Metaurus, where Hasdrubal, the brother of Rome's public enemy number one, Hannibal, was killed. His time fighting against Carthage also gave Cato a lifelong hatred of Rome's greatest enemy, to which he applied his soon-to-be legendary stubbornness and tenacity. Between battles, Cato went home and farmed his lands with his own field hands, dressing and eating and living the same way they did. He wrote De Agricultura, a book on agriculture, farming, rituals, and recipes that is the oldest extant prose written in Latin. His penchant for tough living, and the conservatism that made him seem much older than his years, gained the admiration of his neighbors, who often enlisted his support to settle disputes, sparking his career as an orator. He came to the attention of a nearby nobleman named Lucius Valerius Flaccus, a man always on the lookout for fresh talent, as well as for men who held to the old Roman virtues of conservatism and austerity. Hellenic influence from Rome's more recent conquests in Greece were believed to be bringing an unwelcome element of decadence and luxury into the Roman Republic. In response to this, Cato and the men he associated with put a premium on simple living. In writing a guide to better living for his son, Cato wrote, In due course I shall explain what I found out in Athens about these Greeks, and demonstrate what advantage there may be in looking into their writings while not taking them too seriously. They are a worthless and unruly tribe. Take this as a prophecy. When those folk give us their writings, they will corrupt everything. All the more if they send their doctors here. They have sworn to kill all barbarians with medicine, and they charge a fee for doing it, in order to be trusted and to work more easily. They call us barbarians too. I have forbidden you to deal with doctors. Most doctors in the Republic were Greek. Flaccus accurately surmised that Cato was the new poster child of Roman virtue. With this new political sponsorship, Cato took his show on the road to the Roman Forum, where he launched a career in politics. He was appointed to several high-ranking positions, starting with his appointment as quaestor in 205 BCE. This job was perfect for Cato. His responsibilities included safeguarding the state treasury. In this capacity, he went to Africa with Scipio Africanus, Rome's greatest military commander, the victor of the Second Punic War, vanquisher of Carthage. Unfazed by Scipio's celebrity, Cato took issue with the hero's lavish spending and the lax discipline of his troops. Scipio told this unexpected thorn in his side that he would account for victories, not money. Cato, continuing his lifelong pattern of uptightness and inflexibility, returned to Rome and took the exceptionally unpopular stance of criticizing the Republic's most honored general. 
Despite this, or maybe because of it, Cato was elected to more offices and ended up as the Praetor of Sardinia in 198 BCE, where he was entrusted with the government of the province. Here he put his conservatism and austerity into practice, reducing operating costs, adhering to strict public morality, administering impartial justice, and severely punishing the crime of usury, or charging exorbitant interest rates. There was a revolt in Sardinia during Cato's tenure. I'm sure it was purely coincidental. Regardless, Cato put the revolt down the way he did everything else, quickly and efficiently. Cato was elected consul, the top office in the Roman hierarchy, in 195 BCE at only 39 years old. The hot-button issue of the day was the proposed repeal of the Lex Appia, or Appian Law, which restricted the luxury and extravagance of women in order to save money for the public treasury. It had been enacted during the Second Punic War, when Rome was suffering financially. It also had, as its moral underpinning, a concept close to Cato's heart, the elimination of luxury and self-indulgence, two qualities, it was believed, that undermined Rome's ability to succeed militarily. Applying law only to Rome's women is a bit of a head-scratcher. Well, not really. Under this law, women were not allowed to own more than half an ounce of gold, wear garments of multiple colors, or drive a carriage closer than a mile from the city. I can't wait to see how this plays out. Rome's victory in the Second Punic War solved its financial problems, what with all the money flowing in from its newly conquered territories. The wealthiest men in Rome, many of whom were in the Senate, figured it was time to let women have some of their luxuries back. Or their wives did. Standing in the way was good old Cato the Elder, ignoring, not for the first time, which way the wind was blowing. His patron, Lucius Valerius Flaccus, his fellow consul for the year, opposed Cato on this issue, arguing to the men of Rome that under the hated law their horses would be better attired than their wives, and so it should be repealed for the sake of domestic tranquility. Cato made a speech chastising the women of Rome, telling them that letting them wear fancy clothes would cause some women to feel shame and others to delight in petty victories. He said that a woman's desire to spend money was a disease that could not be cured, but only restrained. He claimed the removal of the Lex Appia would render society helpless in limiting the expenditures of women. He went on to explain that women who had become accustomed to opulence were like wild animals who have once tasted blood in the sense that they can no longer be trusted to restrain themselves from rushing into an orgy of extravagance. The women of Rome, at that moment rioting in the streets in their monochromatic garments, were no fans of Cato the Elder. The consul, tone deaf to the situation on the ground, went on to berate the hapless husbands of these angry women, telling them that they should man up and not let their wives browbeat them into repealing the law. Somehow he managed to get out of that scrape alive, and the law was repealed when the mob of women besieged the Senate and wouldn't let them leave until the Lex Appio was no more. The word Cato, by the way, means common sense that is the result of natural wisdom combined with experience. Whoever gave the family that cognomen was either an accomplished diplomat or an upbeat optimist. Cato was granted the governorship of the province of Hispania Citerior on the southeastern coast of Spain right after this. It is possible that the Senate thought getting Cato out of town for a few years would be a good idea for everyone. The new praetor maintained his reputation for simple living and forthright action. He shared the rations and work of the common soldiers and personally supervised the execution of his orders. His conquest of the province was ruthless and brutal because Cato didn't dawdle. He massacred enemy troops who surrendered and caused others to commit suicide from the shame of defeat. It was during this time that Cato coined the phrase bellum se ipsum alet, 
the war feeds itself. He claimed to have destroyed more towns in Hispania than days he spent in the territory. He returned to Rome in 194 BCE and was granted a triumph. A Roman triumph was a lavish ceremony in which a victorious general was paraded through the streets of the city, dressed in purple and gold, followed by the slaves and treasure captured during the campaign. Because the Romans insisted on humility, a slave stood next to the conquering hero, whispering memento mori, remember, you must die, as a reminder that he, too, was a mere mortal. This last part was probably Cato's favorite. He distributed the spoils of his conquest to his soldiers, instead of enriching himself. His return drew the ire of his old enemy, Scipio Africanus, who was consul that year. Returning the favor done him by Cato all those years before during his African campaign, Scipio asked the Senate to condemn Cato's administration of the province, which some sources say Scipio had wanted for himself. Cato used his powers of oratory and detailed financial records to justify his actions in the province, and once again he got away without any trouble. Scipio Africanus wasn't exactly going to start a Cato fan club. Cato went back to military service and commanded troops in the Battle of Thermopylae in 191 BCE, executing a maneuver that turned the tide of battle in favor of the Romans. His fellow commander and good friend, Lucius Valerius Flaccus, gave Cato full credit for the victory, at least according to the story Cato told. He returned home and once again went after the Scipiones, Africanus and Asiaticus, for corruption. As in Africa years before, Scipio Africanus managed to get out of trouble by citing his earlier exploits in battle on which the current peace and prosperity of the Republic rested. He refused to reply to Cato's charges and said simply, Romans, this is the day on which I conquered Hannibal. He was exonerated by acclamation, avoiding investigation and trial. This was precisely the kind of thing that got Cato's goat. He was made a censor in 184 BCE, and this was his time to shine. The current meaning of the word censorship derives from Cato's tenure in this office. He became the conscience of Rome, expelling senators from their positions for moral failings. He enacted stringent regulations against luxury, showing off, and having a good time, going so far as limiting the number of guests one could have at a party. He took another swing at the piñata in 169 BCE with the passage of the Lex Voconia, a law that limited what he considered an undue amount of wealth in the hands of women. Cato the Elder, still a big hit with the ladies. He also managed to display his contempt for all things Greek. He used his oratorical powers, and his uptight view of the world, to obtain the release of the celebrated Greek historian Polybius and his friends, who had been imprisoned in Rome. His key argument was that the Roman Senate had better things to do with its time than discuss whether a few Greeks should die in Rome or in their own land. He strongly advocated for the third and final war against Carthage in 157 BCE. After their defeat in the Second Punic War, Carthage was prohibited from waging war without Rome's permission. Carthage's immediate neighbors took advantage of this rule and raided Carthaginian territory. Cato was part of the delegation sent to Carthage to mediate its disputes with its neighbors, and he was horrified at Carthage's prosperity. He believed that the survival of Rome depended on the total defeat of Carthage. No matter what speech he was giving in the forum, he always ended it with the line, Carthago delenda est. Carthage must be destroyed. Cato died before his wish came true but Carthage was utterly defeated in 146 BCE, three years after his death. A commission was dispatched by the Senate to make sure Carthage remained in ruins. A curse was placed on anyone who would ever attempt to build on the site in the future. 
Cato would have been pretty happy about that. Over 2,100 years later, in 1985, the mayors of Rome and Carthage signed a symbolic peace treaty. Cato would not have been happy about that. Hopefully his descendants would turn out differently, maybe less strict, less annoying, less stubborn. In a future episode, we'll meet his great-grandson, Cato the Younger, and discover that the apple doesn't really fall far from the tree. Stay tuned for that story in Stubborn Nags of Ancient Rome, Part 2. On our next episode, we find out why the British never referred to George Washington as general, and the fairly significant role the father of our country played in starting the French and Indian War. Stay tuned for George Washington? Never heard of him. For further reading about the events of this show, see the description of the episode for sources. Check out our Facebook page and Twitter feed, as well as our YouTube channel, for more historical train wrecks and their adventures. This is the stuff they never taught us in history class. History is full of train wrecks, and we can't look away. <laughs>